My name is Ebony Stevenson. I am the USDA Access and Accountability Organizer here at the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, we are doing a live stream today to talk about navigating the application process for the USDA 22007 discrimination payments. Um, I am going to uh, pass the mic over, the virtual mic over uh, to my colleagues so that we can do introductions. And then we will get um, into um, talking about uh, what 22007 is and any updates that we have. And then we'll finally get to the application. We will get to as much as we can today. Um, but if we do not finish, we will definitely have a part three of this because we want to make sure that these lives are useful to you as farmers so that you're able to navigate the process smoothly and then receive any technical assistance that you may need in order to make sure that you get these applications by the October deadline. So I'm going to pass the virtual mic over to Shakira to introduce ourselves and we shall start. Thank you so much for joining. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shakira Regoza. I am the National Young Farmer Coalition FSA technical assistant. So I provide assistance with FSA programs, loans, and applications. And if you need any assistance completing the forms after today, please feel free to reach out. We'll be sharing our contact information at the end of the live. Thank you. And I'll pass the mic to Stephen, who's joining us from FLAG. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Stephen Carpenter. Uh, I'm, I work at Farmers Legal Action Group. We're a nonprofit law firm that works on behalf of family farmers. And one of the things that we've worked on for a long time is making sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to, to get a, sh a chance at farming. And so civil rights and discrimination has been uh, an important piece of, wor of our work uh, really from the very beginning. I'm going to be joined soonish here by my colleague Lindsay Keene. And what we wanted to do today was do a really short overview of this program and then take a, a bit of a look at the application. The application is kind of long, but you know, it asks for some certain things. And so we've taken a really close look at it. We have a short version of what we of of things to sort of help people work their way through it. It's about four pages. And then there's a longer version too. So we're Farmers Legal Action Group and you can you can get, you know, you can just Google us or uh, if, if, yeah, so we, we, you'll, you'll be able to find us. And um, as I understand, in my understanding it, the questions can go in, you, there, there may be some questions and we're gonna be happy to answer those to people uh, that have questions, but for now, let's just get the first basic outline of what's happening here. So the issue really that is at the basis of all this is that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has run really good programs, especially actually on paper, loan programs that can help people get going in agriculture, get them some credit on good terms, um, stick with them, even if they have a little bit of a hard time paying. So really, really good programs run, run out of local offices to help people with loans. One problem though has been that going way back, there has been just over and over discrimination in the way that these loan programs that have worked. The discrimination people most often talk about is based on race, uh, especially black farmers, but also others. But we also know that there has been discrimination on gender and sexuality and sex and, you know, a lot of things actually. And because what has happened is that these programs have often been run by local people um, and they, you know, they carried with them their assumptions and prejudices. So what, what this program does, it was created by Congress. It says, okay, if you have tried to use these farm loan programs from USDA, and if you were, if you experienced discrimination, we are setting aside $2.2 billion. 
and we will ask you to file an application to describe that discrimination. And then if you can, can show that there was discrimination, we will be making uh, financial assistance payments to people that can show that discrimination. And there's $2.2 billion. So it's not a lawsuit, uh, but it kind of sounds like one. But it's a, it's a program that Congress created and uh, Lindsay and Young Farmers and other organizations, Lindsay, my colleague at Flag and Flag and Young Farmers and other organizations are trying to help people make sense of this program. And so that's why we're here today. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the basics of the program and then Lindsay and I are gonna uh, try to work through some of this, the parts of the application. So let's just say first that we're talking about discrimination by USDA in its loan program. So a loan you know, where you borrow money either to buy land or you borrow money to, for your operating expenses, you know, to buy equipment or buy cattle or buy um, seeds and fertilizer or buy anything that you need on the farm that you need a loan for. That's the sort of program that USDA has that we're looking at today. So you may have taken part or try to take part in conservation or other programs that Department of Agriculture does. Those are not in this program. This program is just for loans and just for discrimination. So the other really important points here are at the very top are, first of all, there's a deadline for this application. And we're gonna talk a little in a little bit about how you can get help to, to figure out the application, but there's a deadline. It's October 31st. There's some possibility they will extend it, but right now everybody should assume the deadline is October 31. Also, the discrimination must have taken place before January 1st of 2021. So it can't be things that happened, say, this last spring um, or, or in the last couple of years. So it's January 1, 2021 discrimination by USDA in its loan programs. And that discrimination can be any part of you interacting with USDA trying to get a loan. They may say, oh, we don't do that kind of loan or we're out of money or you know, you're not really a good enough farmer. You don't have management ability. All those sorts of things are, can be discrimination. Or if they gave you a loan, but gave you really bad terms, um, then that's also, a form of discrimination, or if they, get, if you ended up um, trying, you know, getting a loan and having a hard time making payments, USDA has rules where they're supposed to try to help you uh, get through that rough period. And if they didn't do that, that also can be discrimination. If they treated you differently and unfairly um, in a discriminatory way, and discrimination is generally based on the sort of things that you know we often hear about race national origin um, your ethnicity which is really a sort of a part of national origin but also your sex you whether you're married your your gender um, all those things can be a basis for discrimination which could end up resulting in you being eligible for financial assistance under the program so October 31 is the big deadline. Um, you, you're gonna need to fill out the application. I wanted to make two quick points about the application in general. One is that um, when you that how important it is for you to tell your story in this application about what exactly happened to you. You might think that the discrimination has to be some sort of a smoking gun. They called you a name or they said, oh, you know, you know, women shouldn't be farmers or you seem like you might be uh, gay. So, you know, we're not really interested and, or, you know, the sorts of things that, that happen, right? And those do happen, but we don't have to have that happen for you to have success in this program. So it makes sense to think really clearly about telling your story so that you can explain to somebody what really happened and, and why that's discrimination. So that really means giving details in this application about what really went down with when you dealt with USDA. And it's no fun to do that, you know, to bring up all this stuff and talk about it. But 
we do have this program, you know, and and um, it really is there. There is real money. This money is going to go out. So if you experience discrimination, well, you know, we hope that you at least think about taking part. So one big piece of it that I want to emphasize is you are going to need to talk about the details of what happened to you. And the more details, actually, the better. If you think about it, somebody's going to read this and make a decision about whether there was discrimination later on. And to convince them, we need to be able to show how the story of what happened to you kind of all holds together. So if you are describing your farming operation or the farm that you wanted to have, tell the details. You know, I was doing fruit and vegetable production. I was, uh, I was, I sold at a farmer's market. I needed some a loan for rent to expand a little bit and for equipment. And this is the farmer's market I sold at, and we did really well with certain types of vegetables. And so that's what we we're going to increase our acreage on, and that's why we wanted a loan. Those sorts of details are really going to make or break the kind of application that you put together. And you know, if it's you, you may have this, the 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 worst case of discrimination, but if you don't put it down, if you don't tell how well, you know what you experienced, you're probably not going to have success with this this program. But if you do tell the details and the timing and what you can remember about who you talked to and what they said, you know, if they told you that we just don't have any applications or you're not eligible say that i mean it, you know if you didn't have much of an interaction you didn't have much but say what did happen the second thing that i, I want to talk about before we go into the details is records and documents so when we are trying to explain what happened to us or to show usda and the people making decisions that we actually farmed we're going to want to have some some records that help show that so if you already, you say if you got a loan from USDA or you were a part of USDA conservation programs, there are records out there then you may have them still that sort of show that you interacted with USDA, that you were a farmer, that you wanted to use their programs. Those are really good to put into the application if you still have them. You don't necessarily have to have them, you know, those are in your own possession right now. And, and so part of what we want to emphasize is that you really do want to be able to show that you farmed or were hoping to farm. But to do that, you need to explain how you were, you were all set up and ready or you were already started. What did you do to learn about farming? What had you already done to sort of get the whole process moving? Um, what is your experience? Did you grow up on a farm? Did you take classes? Had you interned at a farm? Had you done beginning farmer programs? All of those things help show that you would have been a farmer if, if you didn't end up farming, if only they'd given you a loan. Or also, some, you know, for many people, it will be to show that you did farm. And so USDA is really going to want you to come up with some documents to show that you actually farmed. And that may sound hard and weird, but it's not that hard. So if you could just show that you bought seeds or you bought fertilizer, or if you use equipment, you, know, you had fuel costs, or if you sold to uh, a CS, you had a CSA, some of your CSA records will just show that you raised, you, did, you farmed, you had production, you had expenses, and you had some income. Just, you know, just convince a person off the street that you really did farming with your documents. The other thing that to keep in mind is that you can get some of your documents from USDA. So if you did deal with USDA and there are records there, um, that's the sort of thing you can ask them for. And so there is an email address and it's on our four page guide um, that you can get. And you know, I don't think it makes sense to try to read it out, but it's easy to find. It's on USDA's website. It's on um, on our materials at Flag, or young farmers, you know, are going to be able to help you too. So you can ask USDA to get a copy of your own documents. Now, early on, there was a deadline 
that has already passed for those documents. But USDA at the last minute extended that deadline. So you can ask USDA for documents through September 29th. And so they should they should come up with those documents, you know, so especially if you ever had loans with them or you farmed and you had dealt with USDA programs, it makes sense to ask for those documents because it helps show create this picture, the story that you actually farmed. It can also help you show discrimination. If you say, I got this loan, but then they just, they took my equipment away and foreclosed on me right away once I, I couldn't make a payment. Um, if you have a USDA document that shows that you got a loan, that helps you, that helps you paint this picture and tell the story that explains what you experienced. So the two things that I just kind of want to emphasize as a background here is you're really going to need to tell that story and you're going to need at least some documents and the documents seems like a big task the story seems like a big task but you can do it you really just have to sort of explain how you experience the discrimination and make sure you can get some documents some paperwork that that helps support uh, what really went down so that's a sort of most basic outline of, of this program. Um, I'll just emphasize again, you know, this is not a, a scam or something like that. I mean, we, you know, the people on this call, we all spend all our lives like working to try to help struggling farmers. So we wouldn't be here if this was going to be almost no money or it was just sort of USDA going through the motions, but not really having a program. It's real money here. People are going to get paid. If you feel like you experience discrimination and are eligible, we really encourage you to think about it. So, Lindsay, what did I leave out in the basic summary? Hello, everyone. Um, I think you covered all the basics of eligibility and how to get the important documents. So, I imagine we're ready to start going through the application. Um, hi, guys. This is Ebony. Um, I just wanted to um, bring attention to, I know that you said um, if you experienced discrimination through the loan programs, but can you just take a minute to go over uh, the loan programs that this, that this applies to under the FSA? Sure. So if you walked in and you said, we found some land that we can want to buy, but we you know, it's too hard to get a bank loan. Could you make us a loan so we can buy land? that USDA has a program where they'll make that loan. And that's the pro it's that kind of a loan where we're really concerned about discrimination here. And if you and if you experience discrimination, that can result in you getting some financial assistance. You know, a lot of people, you know, weren't trying to buy land. They were trying instead to buy equipment or or some sort of machinery or you know, a hoop house or, you know, you know, you can be an urban farmer and have expenses. You can be way out in the country and you can have expenses. But either way, for, a, for it to work, a lot of people need to borrow and borrow money to, to get the things they need. And especially, as we know, farming is so seasonal. You, know, you have all those costs that come up front. So lots of people try to borrow just to operate and then pay back later. And that's the USDA program. So you may have heard, for example, in the last few years about microloans. If you heard about a microloan program, that's who we're talking about. That's the US Department of Agriculture. You may have heard them called FSA, it's, it's Farm Service Agency, but you know they have their own office, they do their own loans. Um, they, that's, their, that's one of their main jobs here is to do loans for people that have trouble getting credit elsewhere. And you know you may not have heard about them, and and I'm sorry to say if you had no interaction with them, you know you're not going to be helped by this program. But if you did try to work with them, did try to get a loan, or did get a loan actually, um, you may have experienced discrimination, and and that's what we want to get at today. And then also just based off of my conversation with farmers, like I we just also want to highlight that. Oh, say for example, you um, were a young person and you were trying to get a youth loan and you experienced discrimination in getting a youth loan. 
I know that this is something that I've been talking about because this is something that I actually went through myself. And so I actually am filing an application for myself. So for, for just an example, um, I took horticulture in high school. And so my high school diploma was in horticulture. And I reached out to, um, there was no local office in my county. So I had to reach out to the office of my county. I'm in Chicago. Um, and they never sent me the paper application. And when I called, they gave me a hard time over the phone talking about, well, like urban farmer. And I just see, I'll never forget it. Like urban farmers really don't make money. Like, is this something that I want to do? And then I even remember um, when I called like the third time, they were talk. I was talking about the things that I wanted to grow because I had access to a lot um, in my community. And so I wanted to like buy plants and stuff like that. And I remember like, do, do people in, over in, do people in that area even buy plants? Like I distinctly remember these things that were told to me. And so don't think that it's just because you didn't apply for an ownership loan or operating loan, but even if you apply for a youth loan, even if you're not a young person no more, you still <laughs> qualify because you experienced that discrimination prior to January 2021. So I just wanted to highlight that because there's so many people that this does apply to. So we want to make sure that we can get as many applications as possible so that people can get some kind of recourse. And so I just wanted to, I didn't mean to take away from that, but I just wanted to highlight that as an example that a lot of people aren't talking about the youth loan piece. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Lindsay uh, so that we can go over the application. Thank you, Ebony. And I would just add, you know, for folks who there's about a dozen specific um, USDA farm loan programs that qualify and on the 22007 website, there's a link to an FAQ. And I mean, and number six in that FAQ will list all of the loans, you know, the guides that FLAG has published, they will list the specifics. So if people, you know, have questions about specific types of loans and, and whether they qualify, feel free to reach out to Stephen or I or Young Farmers, or just know that that FAQ is another source that kind of lays it out pretty clearly. So, um, okay, I think at this time, Stephen and I are going to um, go through the application. We'll get through as much as we can. Um, as many of you know, it is a long application. It's about 40 pages if you were to print it out. So if you were to do it by hand, it's about 40 pages. Not every step and not every question is necessarily going to apply to each farmer who is filling it out. So um, my initial piece of advice is just to read it very carefully um, because there are portions that you might not need to spend time working on. And then there are other portions that are going to be extremely important to fill out. So uh, my first piece of advice is just to read it thoroughly as you go through each page. And, um, and then the other thing, building off what Stephen was talking about earlier about documentation, every page of the application, or most of them at least, will have a kind of gray sidebar on the right-hand side that will list if there are any required documents that you need to submit. And the way the application breaks it down are into required documentation and the language the application uses is must, so must documents. And then there are often listed what are called May documents. And the May documents, as it sounds like, they're not required by the program, but they are often recommended that if there is a May, quote, May document listed, that you provide it if you can. And again, because this program, you know, there's no appeals, there aren't going to be multiple shots at it. We encourage you, you know, if there are documentations that they are suggesting that you provide and you have relatively easy access to them, it just puts you in a better position to go ahead and do so. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen now, hopefully, so we can see the application. And Stephen, do you want to start with step one and we'll just alternate from there? Sure. So I, I just wanted to add before we start, what a good example Ebony just gave us. Um, you don't have to be a big farmer here. You can be an urban farmer. You can be doing trying to do something in your community. You can be quite young. If they ever, if they ever said, "Oh no, wait till you grow," you know, get older, you know, that was the wrong answer. That was discrimination based on your age, I think. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to point, just to remind everybody. You know, we're just not talking about people with big combines and large operations. We're talking about everybody 
who's trying to, to make a shot at doing some farming. And Ebony's example is just a perfect one for why that means much more than your stereotype of sort of a big grain farmer or a big cattle farm. I mean, it's everybody who's trying to, to grow things and raise things uh, as a part of agriculture. And you, you're just as much of a part of agriculture as, as, as the big shot farmers. So um, I think it's a really great point that, that she was describing. So USDA, uh, <laughs> They, 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 they kindly divide up the application into 10 steps. So what Lindsay and I are gonna try to do is walk you through uh, several, you know, as many steps as we can, and we're happy to come back if we feel like, you know, there's not enough time. And so some of the steps get kind of complicated. Some of them um, are not so much. You can do a, this on hard copy if you want to, but it's, I won't say easy, but you know, if you if you're pretty comfortable going online and filling out forms, you can do it online as well. And I think most people will end up doing it online. And I want to emphasize again that you can get help on this. You're not out here all by yourself. So the first step is just getting some basic information. And you want to be pretty careful here. It sounds crazy to say this, but you want to be careful to make this really accurate because it's if in the end, you know, they begin USDA looks up your records or wants to figure out if you ever actually did get along with them and what or whatnot. You really do want to have the sort of name that you use if you when you dealt with the USDA. Now, some people have create little businesses that farm, you know, especially people doing direct marketing or CSA or you know, farming at a farm stand. And so if you've had a, a, a little corporation or an LLC, I mean, people do all kinds of things. You just want to make sure that all that information gets into this gets into this document, this application, so they know who it is that you were as a farmer, you know, not just your name, but as a farmer. So you wanna make sure you get that good information in there. I'd also say that on, on, on B of this step, one of the things they're gonna do is ask you, after you've verified who you are, you have to prove who you are, is ask you if there's anybody else out there that they can call just in case they have a hard time or contact, have a hard time getting in touch with you. And it's actually a, a good idea if you know somebody who's willing to help help you in that way. It's a good idea because you know you would be surprised at how often wires get crossed and they they think they're trying to get in touch with you, but they something's messed up and they can't find you. So you know if you have somebody who would help you out, if you're you know somebody working working with somebody, um, this sort of be information about alternative contacts it makes more sense than you might think offhand. Also, if you're having somebody help you, if you found somebody to help you work on the form, they should be listed here too. That's part C right there on the, on the bottom page. So uh, the first step, pretty basic. Um, you, it's saying who you are and, and who, how to talk to you and who's helping you out uh, when you do the, the application. Lindsay, step two. Okay, thanks, Stephen. So step two uh, is about the type of applicant you are. And specifically what the application is looking for in this step is to understand if you are someone who is applying individually. So let's say you applied for a loan or received a USDA loan just on your own as an individual person, you know, you're going to make that clear here. But as Stephen mentioned, it's also possible that you can apply, let's say your farm is a legal entity and you have a business name and you applied for a loan under that name. This is the step where you would note that information on the business entity. I imagine some of you were wondering for step one, why it wasn't asking about entities. And, and that's because step two is where you put that information. Um, so you can, again, you can apply to this program as an individual, um, as someone who is a member of an entity. You can also apply as a co-borrower. So um, this often comes up for people who are married, right? So if you and someone else signed on a promissory note or signed for a loan, then you would be applying as a co-borrower and you would note that in this step. 
And finally, step two also wants to know if you are applying as a person who uh, assumed a debt of another. And you know, one thing that this program does not allow is it does not allow people to apply on behalf of an estate. So for example, let's say your grandmother or grandfather was a farmer and let's say they applied for a loan or they worked with USDA and they experienced discrimination in that process. If that grandparent has since passed, you cannot apply for relief with this program on behalf of your grandparents. The only exception to that is if you actually took over the loan and now you are responsible for the same loan that one of your grandparents had with USDA. In other words, if you assumed or you were assigned that loan. And if that is the case, then that's likely to be a smaller number of people who would fall into this category. But if you are someone who assigned, was assigned or assumed um, the loan from another person who experienced discrimination, it is also possible to apply. So those are the general categories of applicants that step two is looking for. And as with step one, you know, you're going to need to provide a lot of identifying information. The one thing I would just emphasize about uh, step two is that this is a step where not every page is going to apply to you. So for example, uh, part B of step two here, information about co-borrowers. If you applied as an entity or if you apply just yourself, then you don't have co-borrowers. So you're not gonna need to fill out this part B. So I just encourage you to look through step two and make sure you're just filling out the sections that apply to you. So again, co-borrowers, entities is part C of step two, and they're gonna wanna know the name, how many entities, um, you have had and in which you experienced discrimination, um, any alternate names that the entity might have been under. So it's all about making sure USDA can identify, you know, who was trying to participate in a loan program or who did. Um, the final thing I would say about step two is if you are applying as an entity, an important thing to know is that the way that payments will work for this program, if you are an entity, the payment will be portioned based on your percentage interest in the entity. So let's say you had a 40% share in a business entity. You are absolutely um, eligible to apply for the program, but you likely would only get 40% of what a payment might be. And if another member of the entity who had a 60% share wants to apply, you know, they would note their percentage and then the payment for the entity would be um, given out accordingly. So I think I'm just going to scroll through again. Part D of step two is if you had were assumed a debt or had an assigned debt. Um, again, just read it closely. And um, Stephen, am I missing anything for step two? I don't think so. Okay, I think we're then. here. Great. So step three is where the rubber really begins to hit the road. Uh, this step is is going to ask you to explain uh, that you were either were a farmer, well, for this one, step three and four together, either that you were a farmer and are therefore, el were, would have been eligible for a loan and are eligible for this program, or you wanted to be a farmer and were all set up to do so if only you had got a loan from USDA. So step three, you'll see here the headline is eligibility for this program as a farmer and or rancher. And so when we say rancher, I mean, just we, we just say farmer just to be sure. We know lots of people out there are ranchers and some don't even really like to be called farmers. Um, but we're instead of saying farmer and rancher uh, every time we we just say farmer. So apologies for that. But um, this is the step where you if you you farmed, and as a farmer, you try to get a loan from FSA, from USDA. You are really are need to provide some details to explain your farm. Um, this is really important. Again, you got to take a step back in your own mind and think, okay, I'm trying to persuade somebody who I've never met, who will never come to my farm, will never see anything that I ever did, I want to make sure they understand that I really was a farmer, that I really did it. 
and therefore would have been eligible and, and could have had a much more success if I would not have had to experience discrimination by USDA. And you might think, and so, so where we go with this is if you're a farmer or a rancher, they wanna know things like, did you own the land or did you lease the land? You know, pretty simple sort of. But then it goes further and we start saying, well, where was the farm? And, and you really need to ex explain it. And one of the things that we emphasize is, boy, just don't let somebody have a doubt as to whether you really did this because you don't say enough. So we know lots of, lots of farms have just a street address, just like anything else, both urban and rural. Um, some people are renting out lands in suburbia, you know, and, and then doing a farmer's market. That's fine too. It doesn't matter where the farm was. You just need to be able to say where it was. And if you're way out in the country, uh, it can be especially hard to come up with an actual address. So my suggestion is to say, well, um, we were in the southeastern part of the county. It was on Ranson Road and there were about 14 acres that we used to do vegetables, sweet corn. And um, it was south of Highway 50, but north of uh, Gambrel Road. I mean, it sounds crazy, but those are the sorts of things that, that you can do to make sure you convince somebody who's only gonna see this on a computer screen that you really were a farmer. And so you wanna explain the things that you did, uh, what, you know, again, not, not just where the farm was, but what you did there, how you were really ready to succeed on this farm if you had been treated without discrimination by USDA. And one of the things that, that worries people, and I, and I think rightly so, as you see on the right side of this page, supporting documentation requests. They make it sound a little bit harder than it really is in a way. I mean, they think that, that they say you must provide a document. If you say you farmed, you must provide a document to show that you did have control of this farm. So if you own it, it's pretty easy um, in the sense that if you have property tax records or something like that. But as we know, a lot of people that are younger trying to farm are renting. So here though, you you need, you're gonna need to do other, you know, and, and um, or you, well, you can do other still with you own, but if you leased, if you didn't own the farm, you still are gonna wanna try to come up with some sort of a document to show that you actually were able to farm there. And I know a lot of people don't have written leases, but still you need to do everything you can to try to, to show with a document that you were farming in this certain place. Um, and you can see here the, the list, you know, and one of the things that USDA will emphasize is that if, is if you ever worked, if you ever, your farm was ever, you were ever involved in USDA programs, your farm likely has a farm number. And you know, don't sweat it if you think that there is no farm number, it's okay, you can use other means. But if you did do like a conservation program or something, and there's a farm number on your records, it's great to use that because that just sort of ends the question because it, it sat satisfies USDA. And if you did something with the USDA with their programs, this is a good thing to ask them for through the email system that we were describing just a little bit earlier. So, so you say, I farmed on this farm and this is my name, and but I don't know the uh, actual farm number. And so that would be you know, satisfying to them. So if you look on, on the page that Lindsay is just, just rolling up, it says in a few sentences, please describe your farm or ranch during the period of discrimination. And again, it sounds silly, but if you, but here details really help. So if, if you were doing uh, a CSA, if you just say we did a CSA and we had about 70 or 90 or whatever it was customers, or say we were selling at Cass County Farmers Market, that's great. But 
the more, you know, going into a lot more detail of what you actually raised, how did you market it? What were you doing? How, you know, did you have three people, you, you, uh, you know, a partner and a friend were doing the work, say that. If you had 11 acres that was in sticking with sweet corn, you had a big sweet corn crop. And then we also did tomatoes and later on we had pumpkins in the fall. Just say all that stuff, because what it does is begins to, to create a clear image to the decision maker who's trying to decide, trying to say, okay, we believe this story, we believe this account of discrimination. You, the way that holds together is you describe what really went down. And that includes, when you look at these big blue spaces here, that includes describing what actually happened on your farm that you were doing. Um, so here, here you see the example Lindsay just pulled up. If you don't have a farm number, then you know here are some other ways that you can try to kind of go about showing you know, where your farm was and, and proving that it actually happened. So B is the, the question, which gets raised a lot. Um, what if you never farmed, but would have farmed if you only could have got an FSA loan, a USDA loan? And you can get you can have success in this program if that fits your situation. And if you think about it, if you if you like look at USDA's website, they have loan programs which specifically are for beginning farmers. I mean, there is nothing nothing says you have to have an operating farm before you get a USDA loan. Let, you know, let's be really clear about that. You, know, you do not have to have had a farm to have success in this program. But there's a big but, and the but is, you do need to be able to show that you could have farmed. And so that means describing your experience. You know, for a lot of you know, young people, that might mean, oh, I did 4-H, or I did FFA, or I studied uh, horticulture in high school, or I took a junior college class on agriculture. Some of us, you know, some people, got an agriculture degree at a university. I mean, there's a whole range and, and that's just education. You know, you also have things like, well, what are your experiences? Some people grew up on a farm. Other people worked on farm as, as an intern or you work summers for somebody on somebody else's farm or you, you know, you assisted in any other way. You might have been a farm laborer that got paid. You might have volunteered. Um, anything like that is really important here um, to show that you would have had ability to succeed with the loan. You also want to describe exactly what you would have done with your farm. So if you were if you had your eye on 10 acres that you could rent, if you could just get a loan for the upfront rental cost and get a little bit of money for seeds and fertilizer, say all that. Say we had 10 acres, we knew what our market was going to be. Um, if we could have just been able to get some credit, we would have been able to go forward farming because we had the knowledge, we had the management ability, you know, we had the experience, Although we didn't actually farm on our own, we had all kinds of experience and we had this plan. If we just could have received a loan, we would have had success. And so that's perfectly possible with this program. But when you see, see all these blue spaces, you know that they expect you to explain all of this, to explain, um, I mean, if you just look at this page, G, types of livestock you intended to raise. So if you're out in the country and you're going to do poultry, let's say you were going to do an egg and then and then sell some broilers, you need to say we plan. You know we had a chicken house set up. We had we're ready to market the broilers. We had we're working on a list of people to sell some eggs. Uh, we were going to have a delivery system of once a week with broilers throughout throughout. You need to explain all of that. I'm just 
and we were going to get our grain from such and such place and we had all the heaters set up and the watering system for chicks where you i mean it sounds again mundane but it's only through doing stuff like that that you should you can show that you really would have had success as a farm so don't be shy about just laying it all out there some things that you may not have ever even written down that you just plan for now you need to get them um inputted here to, to tell your complete story um any other details i mean look at that right you just they they just will soak up any information that you have about what you might have done so I think that's step three. Lindsay, what what any anything you would add? I don't think so. I think we can move on to step four. And um, you all are probably recognizing one thing this application does a lot of is sort of, you know, there's different kind of classes of applicants. So just as Stephen went through, you can apply if you were a farmer or are a farmer, but you can also apply if you intended to be. And the same is true for step four. The step four is really about the type of borrower or attempted borrower an applicant is. And what I mean by that is you can apply to this program if you apply for and received a farm loan program loan from USDA, either as a direct borrower, meaning that USDA and FSA were your lenders, or as part of a guaranteed loan program, meaning that maybe you went through a credit union or a private bank to get a loan, but that loan was guaranteed by USDA. So you can absolutely apply if you received a loan from USDA or FSA, either as a direct or guaranteed loan, but you can also apply if you tried to get a loan from USDA, but you were denied because of discrimination. And so step four is all about figuring out which type, which category you fall within and getting information on that. So you can see this first part, if you participated in direct lending, if you participated in guaranteed, or if you attempted to participate in a direct lending program or a, a guaranteed program. Um, and for the kind of likely the smaller group of people who are applying as someone who assumed uh, a debt, then, you would fill out and you would look back to what the original lender, whether they participated in a direct or guaranteed loan program. So um, one thing to note on this, you know, in all of these sections as part of step four, they're going to be interested in the type of loan that either you received or that you applied for. So if you did obtain a direct or guaranteed loan, uh, if you have a loan number, that's going to be really important for information. Um, you can see in uh, part two of section A, it has you check the exact type of loan. And as Ebony was mentioning earlier, youth loans are just as eligible as any other type of loan, microloans, ownership, operating loans. These are all the different types of loan programs that are eligible. Um, so you would mark that. Um, and then, you know, the application wants to understand, you know, information about the loan if you receive one. So the amount um, the amount of debt you currently still have, uh, and the total number of payments that you've made to date. So um, the final thing I would say on this first part is this is another area where documentation is going to be important. So if you did receive a loan from USDA or FSA, um, you need to provide some form of documentation that you did. So clearly, if you have a copy of the loan itself, um, the promissory note, that's great, provide that. Um, but you could also, you know, if you have been providing payments to, to USDA or FSA and you have copies of those checks you or statements, bank statements, you know, you can include that to show. Um, so it's okay, even if you don't have the actual copies of the loan documents, you know, get creative, anything that you can provide to show that you did have a loan and that you were making payments on them, that can be used. Um, so I'm just going to kind of scroll through. You can see part B is about if you participated in a guaranteed loan. Oh, yes. Sorry, Ebony. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question. I know we have five minutes left, uh, but also something, if you can scroll back up uh, to the loan mm -hmm. type. Um, I know that uh, we had a call uh, the other day. Uh, don't ask me what day it was. My days are blending into each other. But um, Stephen, I believe you talked about 
um, not leaving out people who were discriminated against for the emergency loans. And I think uh, that we talked about um, the the hurricane um, in Puerto Rico and how those farmers uh, were discriminated against. Can you say a little bit about that? Because this also came up um, in conversations with some of the farmers uh, from like Florida um, and then also uh, I think it was Texas uh, and Louisiana. Um, I know the farmers in Florida were having questions about, you know, like what if they did act like they really didn't want to work with them to fill out a, a emergency loan for flooding. Um, and then also uh, in Texas, uh, they were asking about like drought and stuff like that with the 100 degree, uh, over 100 degree days that people actually lost crops. So can you just say a little bit about that? Sure, happy to. So one thing to remember is that the discrimination isn't just in denying a loan, though there's plenty of that. They discriminate sometimes when they just discourage you from applying, tell you not to bother, that can be discrimination. Or you actually apply and they turn you down, that can be discrimination. The terms of the loan can be discriminatory. But one of the things that isn't so obvious sometimes is what happens if you have problems and the problem might be you have a problem making a payment or let's say to go straight to Ebony's point what happens if you have a loan or even if you don't have a loan and there's a natural a natural disaster and as we know for farmers that can just seem biblical right I mean all the possibilities flooding hurricanes drought hail tornadoes I mean it goes on and and this summer if you're you know near where I am in the Midwest the issue is drought but in other cases um, it's 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 drought but it's also heat you know just all those hundred day, degree days or you have a hurricane or and we're about to have another hurricane you know hit hit the northeast coast so the point here is twofold first if you have a loan and either because of a natural disaster or because of other problems you might have, and you have a difficulty paying the loan back, or you just get things destroyed, you get a crop destroyed, USDA's own rules say that they're supposed to try to help you make it through. So they can extend your loan out. They can def what's called a defer your payment, um, do things that make it easier for you to, to make it through. If you had a natural disaster, actually, they even have a special loan program. You'll see it here in this little chart, emergency loans um, that Lindsay just highlighted. So the whole point of an emergency loan is to help people who are facing a natural disaster. And what happens a lot of times is that let's say you already have a loan and you have a natural disaster and USDA just kind of pretends like these programs don't exist. Like, like the emergency loans are there for people who can't get a loan because they had a disaster. And that can be whether you already had a loan or not. And so one of the things that, that Ebony, Ebony and I heard and Lindsay too was in Puerto Rico after a big hurricane, they all did almost none of the things it sounds like that they should have to try to help people that were already borrowers. And so it, these areas of the country that have drought, that we've had flooding, uh, hurricanes, for all those cases, um, you really, you know, you should be able to get some flexibility on your loans that you already have. If you, you very well could be eligible for an emergency loan, and it's something that that people just kind of don't don't know about. And so um, so I hope that helps fill in the details there. I think we might have lost Ebony for the moment. Um, but that's I'm that's back. these these various loan programs, you know, and if you're filling this out and you don't know which loan you actually got because they have all these strange names, but you just know that it was for operating expenses. You know, you can you can um, just say that. I mean, I would check the 
the one that you think most likely. And then down below, you can you can say, I'm not sure if it was an emergency or an operating loan, but we used it in order to uh, you know buy seed, uh, for example. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry I got uh, cut off for a second there, <laughs> um, but I'm back. Um, so um, that concludes our part two of our 22007 uh, navigating the application. Uh, and we will have um, a part three, four, five, and six coming up to make sure uh, that you guys have everything that you need in order to make sure this process goes as smoothly as possible. Um, I know that uh, Leticia dropped the um, link for the intake form for Rural Coalition if you need technical assistance. Um, can you guys say your email addresses uh, so that Leticia can drop those in the Facebook chat and then we will be ending this one hour uh, session. Sure, I'll go first. So uh, my email is S Carpenter, S C A R P E N T E R at flag inc, F L A G I N C dot org. And I did just message uh, Letitia as well, but it's L K U E H N at flag inc dot org. And then mine is ebony, E-B-O-N-E-E, -E -E, at youngfarmers.org. My email is Shakira, S-H-A-K-E-R-A, -E at youngfarmers.org. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time.